Welcome to McNally Robinson Booksellers, located here on Treaty 1 territory, the traditional territory of the, the Anishinaabe and homeland of the Métis Nation. My name is Dana, and on behalf of the store, it is my pleasure to welcome you he all here tonight to the launch of Letters from Leah by Terry Letienne. I'll be back at the end to review some housekeeping notes, and here to offer a few words of introduction, please join me in welcoming a friend of Terry and the president and CEO of Canada's History Society, based here in Winnipeg, Janet Walker. Well, hello and welcome everyone. Thanks for being out here on such a beautiful night and in this air-conditioned comfort. I am delighted to host this evening's event. It's great to have all of you here. This is the launch of a first book written by Winnipeg author Terry Letien. Many of you will know Terry by her married name, Terry Samborski. I know her as a former professional colleague from the University of Winnipeg Foundation where we worked together some years ago. I actually thought it was about six years ago, and Terry, the historian more than I am, tells me that it was 10 years ago we worked together. It seems that much has happened over these 10 years, and while Terry has caught up with me over that period, it's clear that her writing and evident passion for history and memory and family is growing and remarkable. Terry, I know you have family and friends here, and I first want to say congratulations on your work and everything that you have accomplished in arriving at this place, the launch of a first book. And um, the story itself is one that Terry writes um, in about 200 pages. And I must say, I, I actually flew through this book. I could not put it down. It's based on actual letters written by Lee Mayhe, a 28-year-old 20 year wife and mother, while she was in hospital in southern Manitoba during the Depression. The original letters were written in French and were kept by Leah's family for over 80 years. It's my pleasure as well to introduce Lee's grandson, Joe Mayhe, who is here this evening and will join us up front. Joe and his family have played a collaborative role in this project, and he is here to help us learn about the importance of this story of Leah in the life of her descendants. It is my pleasure, and I hope you will join me in some applause, in welcoming Terry Lechen and Joe Mayhe. As they settle, I just want to tell you that the books are um, self-published through Friesen Press. They're, they're just glorious, beautiful little books, and they're for sale here at McNally Robinson. The cost of the book is $21.95, and following our conversation, your books can be signed and purchased um, just up here uh, at the front. You can uh, to be signed and purchased on your way out. So I'm going to settle myself in. We are going to have a conversation from these chairs, and I'm hopeful that there may be some questions that um, come from you as the audience at the end of our, uh, our little interview period. So just till I find the next microphone. Thank you. Oh boy, this is way better. Okay, I'm getting coached on how quick, how close I need to be. So this is for all of us. We will, we will speak close to the microphone. So um, I think it was Terry's idea to have these comfy chairs up at the front with arms and all the rest of it. It's a great idea. I'm wondering, Terry, if you might help us begin the conversation this evening by telling us a little bit about yourself. I'm thinking about where you grew up and uh, tell us a little bit about your own family. I'm going to, okay, is this good? Am I too close? All right, so I grew up uh, right here in Winnipeg, actually. Um, back in the day, it was the city of St. Boniface. Um, grew up in, in old St. Boniface, Boniface until I was about uh, eight years old, and then uh, we eventually we moved to uh, Windsor Park. Uh, my parents are both Francophone, um, and uh, raised five daughters, and my four sisters are in the audience tonight, I'm happy to say. Um, and uh, yeah, we, um, you know, large francophone family and... Uh, 
lived in St. Boniface. Do you speak French? I do speak French. I, um, I believe I didn't speak English until I started school, actually. And then when we moved to Windsor Park, of course, I had uh, neighbors that were, uh, that were English, and then I started to speak English then. So when you were a child, did you think of yourself or dream of yourself as being an author? Never as an author. I, I, um, I think I always, I loved writing. I always loved writing. Um, but I never, certainly never thought, um, that I would be, I would be writing books, especially, um, probably not anything that ever came to, to mind. So who or what inspired you to become a writer? Um, what inspired me to become a well? I, I think my uh, through my uh, series of jobs, I, I worked uh, in different careers, and uh, writing was always a part of everything that I that I did. Whether it was uh, minutes of meetings, which I know you've read many of, um, uh, I, it, it then expanded into other things. It expanded <clears throat> into um, uh, doing newsletters and and uh, writing profiles, and so uh, that's the the what inspired me. The who inspired me, uh, you know. I know one of my former bosses is here today, and uh, he I I was hired to be a, an office manager, and this guy gave me the opportunity to write. And he, they it was a marketing company, and they did company profiles, and um, he offered me, you know, he he said if you want to write, you write, and within six months I was writing all of their profiles. So. It was, you know, so I kind of knew then that I had a little bit of a knack for it, I suppose. But <laughs> before that, I never really did. I just, it's just something I did. It's just not. Did you ever take courses or training I did. programs? I, I took courses. And actually, you know, one of the university writing courses that I did take, um, I was singled out at it by a professor. And, and uh, he had said, he, you know, he was going to read a, 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 an essay that had been written and he said I haven't done this in 10 years but I'm going to do it and 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 as soon as he said it I almost like I knew it was going to be mine and I just you know but there again I it it, it made me it, it emphasized that I could write but it never ever made me think that I could be that I would be an author so this is a story about family and I'm wondering about how your own family experience might have helped shape or have an impact on your ability to write this story? Um, well, growing up, um, I, you know, I don't remember reading a whole lot of books growing up. I was not as avid a reader, which is interesting because a lot of people say that writers are, are avid readers. And I don't know that I was, I do remember absolutely the, um, the Nancy Drew series. I read all of those. And I think I was always more concentrating on the character and the story I never really thought of the um, the author, and and you know, funny enough, uh, the Nancy Drew stories. Carolyn Keene is a series of a whole bunch of authors. It's a pseudonym for for a whole bunch of authors. So, um, you know, I, I never I, I never thought of the author part of it. I always thought of the story part of it. Thank you. So, Joe, um, this is a story about your grandmother, and I'm wondering if you can help us understand about when you first knew of these letters and how they came into your hand and how you decided to take the steps that, and what those steps were? Um, I guess I've known about the letters most of my life, that they, they originally came from um, a great aunt who had them many years, and then she gave them to my uncle in the mid-1960s, and then he had them for a number of years. And then at some point, uh, he gave them to my dad, who uh, would have been in 19, early 1970s. So I'm born in 1963. So in a way, I've always known about the letters. But I guess maybe what the amazing thing is, is that they have remained intact, probably exactly the way they were 80 years ago. They're, they're basically untouched. They're, they're in the same box that at least the last 60 years. Um, they're all written in pencil, they're all legible, they're just, it's like they're folded up, put away, and that's exactly how they are today. They haven't, they haven't really changed. How so, many, how uh, many letters? Ooh, uh, yeah, 50 or 60. So how much space does that take? Like, is it a large, what size uh, hand size? Look at the front of the book. The front of the book. Yeah. That's the actual that's, box. That's the actual yeah, box. I don't know if you, if you okay. want to hold, yeah, like that's, that's how they are today. The yeah, exact yeah. same way as they've always been. Uh, so it's amazing to me in a way, well, it's not amazing that we have them because I've always known they're there, but I think for people 
that at some point someone didn't just discard them or uh, you know or, or take them apart or separate them or do anything like that they're just exactly how they were so you decided to have them translated is that how it began uh yes because i don't speak french or i can't read french so they've always been in in uh, or they're written in french so i've never been able to take them out myself and look at them my my parents did occasionally just to uh you know read parts of them uh so at some point four or five years ago we decided to get them translated and that's uh when i saw terry to get them translated and she did uh did a fabulous job on that part so at that point we decided to carry on it was my mom always thought they would make a good book like because she knew what was what was inside so probably that had a bit of a inkling in the back of my mind that that's where where they would start so what can you tell us about Leah's children so this would be your father baby Maurice who's right. referred to in the story and your uncle who Leah calls little Jean right they're still uh they're still both living they're in their mid 80s uh, they've had probably average middle class lives. The, they, uh, the, you know, have children, grandchildren, and uh, and have done well for themselves. And how old would they have been at the time Leah was writing those letters? Uh, my dad would have been four months old when she started, and my uncle would have been a year and three months. So she she went into the hospital when uh, they were very young. So she was in the hospital for one year. So this was um, <clears throat> quite an experience for your father and his uncle. And you think about the um, experience of having these letters and then making a decision that it was time to translate. How did it go to the next step of actually going to the writing of the story? And what was your role in that? Um, I guess before we got them translated, I wasn't sure exactly what they said so if it was uh, really a story there or if it was just letters that didn't necessarily tell anything so once they were translated and we were able or I was able to read them and other people were able to read them then at that point uh, is when we decide to carry on with the book and Terry was very passionate about the the letters themselves and she seemed to have a connection with with Leia and and could sympathize with her and how she wasn't with her children for that whole, for that mm -hmm. time period. I think putting them in chronological order um, really told a story. That's when we realized that it was a story because I think they were always kind of looked at, they were all mixed in this box and not ever really put in an order uh -huh. and and taken the time to put them in an order that, that would really show that there's a story there. So uh, it's once we put them in chronological order, yeah, I think that, that's when that we were connected. able to sort of connect the dots and kind of pace what happened. And, and you know, it, it's, it wasn't just an easy thing. It wasn't an easy diagnosis. It wasn't easy. Like, so you see the ups and downs of that throughout the, you know, and people who read the book will see that. It, uh, it definitely tells a story throughout, it weaves a, a story throughout the letter. So the um, yeah, sorry. you go ahead. So so the book itself, the letters have not been changed. Like what you see, those letters are what was written. Like yeah. we haven't changed. Uh, you know, it's gone from French to English, but we haven't changed paragraphs around. We haven't uh, tidied yeah. it up. What's what you see written is is what Pretty much was written by Leia. So the, the book has been called a fictional story, and some have called it a novel. And I I did um, find it to be incredibly rich in detail. It talks about um, illness before penicillin. It talks about life in southern Manitoba in the 30s. It includes details of Grand Clarier, where uh, she lived, the Souris Hospital, the Nanette Sanatorium. It, it's, it's incredible how much detail is is in this story. T tell us about um, what Lee's letters actually told you that made you realize there was something behind this story. Um, well, first of all, to me, the letters were just so powerful. Um, I, you know, as soon as I read them, I immediately felt a connection to Leah. Um, I, you know, being a mom, um, you know, I remember leaving my kids for a weekend and missing them, and I just right away felt like even after a week of her being away with and you can just see in her letters every single letter 
is, you know, says how much she misses her kids and, and hugs and kisses to them. And um, so I connected with that. I connected with her. Um, and then I also connected with with her very practical side because she did have a, a very practical side as well. And, you know, in one breath, she's talking about how she misses her kids. And then in the next breath, she's talking about her garden that needs to be cleaned up before winter. And, you know, like she just, it just, that just all kind of comes out. So, so that certainly is, is, you know, what, um, connected me to the letters. Um, it, it, there, there was just so much information as well about the, the medical case and and that was in, that's interesting I you know I had people help me I've had a, a friend uh, who's a doctor and a friend who's a nurse and they helped me on the medical side and and people who've read it with a medical background really f find it fascinating and and um, it's almost like a, a mystery really throughout because we we really didn't put we we knew who the doctor was, but we didn't know what he was thinking, and we don't have medical backgrounds. And the publisher really suggested that we keep it as surprising as it was to her, because from one day to the next, she just didn't know what was going on. And so the only hint is the letters themselves. And so people with medical backgrounds, I think, will will enjoy this. I know that already. You know, the few that have had that have read it have have told me that they do. So. And so tell me about Leah's writing style. Is she a good writer? She is. Well, I think she's a good writer. I mean, she, you know, it's 1932, so she probably had, I don't know. I mean, I don't uh, know if she had a grade 8. Maybe, yeah, or probably grade 8 yeah. education. Yeah, we yeah. checked some of the school records, and <laughs> although I'm not 100% sure if it's yeah. grade 8, the, the school she went to was a little community called Maple Hill, Manitoba, which uh, went up to grade 8, and I believe she went to grade eight, but uh, mm -hmm. we had some of the school records, but I'm yeah. not positive on that. Yeah. But so, she, she spoke uh, English, French, wrote English, French. Yeah. She, and uh, we have English letters. Yeah, we yeah. have English letters, French yeah. letters. She was very well, well spoken uh, based on letters. She yeah. uh, was very, very mm -hmm. well written, I guess you'd yeah. say. We didn't use the English letters because they weren't relevant to the story at all. They had been written four years before. Um, we do have a little reference to it in the beginning of the book, uh, but she wrote letters on behalf of her mother uh, to the Department of Education, and uh, the mother had a a beef with something that was going on in in, in the school system, and 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 her mom is another interesting character. We'll talk about that after. But she, so she asked. Leah to write letters to that she couldn't explain herself in English, so she uh, these letters were in French, or, or she spoke French. So the uh, Leah wrote these letters in English, and yeah. and they're quite good. Like we've oh, got yeah, them all, good. we've got a, a bunch of them, but we didn't include them in the in the book. So I'm thinking about the um, uh, research that you needed to do to fill in the blanks between the letters, and tell me about what that's um, like how you went about doing the research. And I'm interested in whether or not that turns the book of letters into a fiction, how that, how that actually works. Hmm. Um, the, the research, Joe did an awful lot of the research and his wife, Michelle helped in the research as well. Um, the, a, a lot of, actually a lot of the research that we did, and, and we also spoke to family members. We have, um, uh, there's a, a niece of uh, Leah's niece uh, who was in her um, her uh, mother was Lisa, Leah's closest sister uh, gave us some great insights and you know she heard remembered stories that her mother talked about Leah so we had a lot of that and it, it, it's funny Joe always said when, what, there was a few times through this process he said you know we should have done this 30 years ago because then would have been a lot easier it would have been a lot easier because we would have had a lot more people to talk to. <laughs> But, um, you know, I think things happen for a reason, and uh, it, it did the way that it did. And maybe it wouldn't have been a fiction. Maybe it would have been a more accurate thing. But, you know, the one thing that you can't do, you can find out, you know, names and dates and stories. And stories were great. We even got stories from, you know, we got stories from his dad. I went to Saskatoon. I went, you know, when we met people, relatives, and I, I spoke to both uh, Jean and Maurice and got stories from them. And so we, we had a lot of stories, but what you don't, ever get if you want it to be I, I wanted that emotion of, of what she felt because the, lead, the letters are so emotional that I wanted to 
show that emotion and uh, what she felt and what he felt and how, th- you know, and she was very positive for the most part. She was so positive through the whole year and kind of talked him up. And, you know, so I wanted that to be in, in the, in the story and for that to happen, we don't know how they interacted, right? We, yeah, you know, nobody knew how they interacted. So we had that, that's what made it fiction, but we certainly tried to keep it as real as possible. We, um, I mean, we kept, I, I, I even uh, Googled every date that where I talked about weather because I needed to know, you know, it, it was, if there was a big, big blizzard, then they couldn't travel 30 miles to the hospital. So I would, so I would Google every single day that, that we talked about weather to see if it related to the story. Okay, well, because of that, no, they didn't go that day because there was a blizzard or that, you know. So every, yeah, every weather uh, story, anything to do with weather is the actual weather that happened in 1932 and 33. Um, we, you know, a lot of things like that, I think we tried to keep real. Yeah. You mentioned the uh, the weather um I guess one one idea I'd always heard was she wasn't uh, at the beginning. She was in the hospital quite a while, but if they could have taken her to the hospital a day, day or two sooner, or people thought maybe, you know, they waited too long. Before, you know, it's a an appendicitis attack. Maybe she should have been taken sooner. But then you check the weather, and there happened to be a storm the day before they went in. So you don't know if if that actually had an effect on their decision making, or if it just it just happened to be that way. You, you can't imagine what they were thinking, or maybe that's just just the way it went. Um, but the National Archives is a really good spot to get mm-hmm. information. We found uh, a lot of information actually on our, uh, you know, for other relatives. Mm-hmm. Um, vital statistics, you can find uh, pretty much anything mm-hmm. there. The other thing too is we, uh, and you, you'll love this being president of the Historical Society of Canada's History Society, the town of Grand Clarier in 1988 um, created a book and it has stories of every family since the inception of that town. And it's phenomenal. I mean, the, the, the things that I found in there were just, you know, and, and just really neat little stories. So uh, I know, you know, we talked about the, the, the Leah's mother, Sylvie. I mean, Sylvie, you know, that's now we're going back even another 20 or 30 years. So how do we find out how there's nobody around that knew Sylvie, you know? So, um, but these stories would, were just amazing that we found of her, about her in there. And we were, you know, I was able to build on that. I was able to build on. It's quite incredible when you think you can actually lay your hands on letters and then you can do some research and then you find those little gems of wisdom and insight that can mm-hmm. take you somewhere. I do struggle with the, the definition of fiction and I, and I, I'm working in the area of history and I know that oral history is one of those new emerging areas. that's going to open up all kinds of new gateways for us. Mm-hmm. You two are pulling together, uh, an incredible story based on letters that were heretofore um, not even being able to be understood. Mm-hmm. I think about as you put together this kind of a project and, and coming together around a project like this is a huge thing in itself, but who are you actually writing the book for? Who, who, who is your audience when you write this book? First and foremost, I wrote this for the Mahi family. Absolutely. I, I, um, I, you know, th- the descendants didn't get to know their grandmother and I wanted them to get to know her. So that, that was my, my first thing for sure. Um, you know, and that's why we tried to keep it as real as possible. The other thing I want to mention about being as real as possible, every name in the book is the actual name. And a lot of that is because the letters refer to that. She talks about Dr. Fraser. So we kept it Dr. Fraser. So we know nothing about Dr. Fraser. Didn't have a lot of information, but we did keep his name in there and all of the relatives names are in there. And so the names are real and yeah, we kept all of that. And, uh, the, the, uh, one of her roommates, Mrs. Gavro. It mm-hmm. took us a while to figure out who she was, but that was a bit of an accomplishment had, yeah. to actually find <clears throat> out who she really was. She, she and then we had a history on her yeah. once we realized who she was. Yeah. But that was, I found that was a good fill in, yeah. you know, if we didn't know who she was, it yeah. would have been a yeah. different uh, part there. Yeah. So we did, you know, you asked what we were writing for. So first and foremost, I said the May family, um, but beyond that, I think at some point Joe and I talked about, and, and I think it was the the public, we self-published through Friesen Press, and at one point they had a questionnaire for us, and they said, um, you know, if this is for the family, you've done what you've needed to do, just 
stop right there and just publish it and go ahead. But if you're wanting to market it, you know, so that was really when we, yeah. gee, are we marketing it? Are we, <laughs> you know, and, and we didn't have a preconceived we didn't really notion have, no, to start with. Really. No. So, so we, we certainly, you know, we knew they, we both knew, I think by that point that there was something there and the story was good. And, um, so then we thought, okay, well then who are we marketing it to? So, uh, I would <laughs> like to think historians, <laughs> Um, uh, absolutely people who are interested in history and like I mentioned before uh, med- the medical side is is interesting as well um, the uh, you know the type of story that it is I think it's a genre uh, that that people like I mean I I was raised on tearjerkers we were five girls at home so you could imagine my poor dad <laughs> we'd plug in a put in a tearjerker and he'd walk away throw a box of Kleenex in the living room and leave <laughs> So, you know, the, there's that aspect to it. I think people like that genre of, thing, of, of reading. And then I think uh, letters in general, um, it, you know, it's becoming a lost art. It really is. It's um, people don't write letters much anymore. And then, you know, everything's all electronic now. And, and even the, 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 the issues that Leah faced of, you know, being at home uh, or being in the hospital and, and uh I mean, you know, I'm thinking of my own kids, my, you know, my daughter sitting here with her little boy. If she was in the hospital, she'd be on FaceTime and she'd be FaceTiming every day and she'd be, have a hundred pictures. Like it took, you know, and this is something for you to read in the story, but it took a long time for her to get just one picture of her two boys, you know, like it, it's just the times, right? So, um, you know, that's, yeah. Would now be a good time for you to read us a one of the well, letters or an excerpt from your book? Absolutely. Okay. Close. Can close. you yeah. can you hear me? Okay. So I'm going to read um, the very first letter. Uh, that uh, Leah wrote when she was in the hospital. Uh, and just a little preamble. I, so, of course, the letters were all in French, and they were all translated in English, but I did want to keep a little bit of French in there, and you know, and people who don't speak French could still understand. Um, and so I, every letter started with either Cher Louis to her uh, husband or uh, Cher Sylvie, or Cher Mama to her mother. And I, so I left the Cher. Uh, and then you'll see there's a few other times where I just leave the French word in. So this was written Friday, October 21st, 1932. Cher Louis, I'm well enough. I slept through the night for the first time since I've been here. I don't think that I will be able to return home next week unless things take a turn for the better. How is little Maurice? I'm sure he's no longer thinking of me. And Jean, he must ask often for his mother. Let both mothers know how I am as I am not able to write for long. Once I can sit up in bed, I will write to let you know when I might possibly go home. If La Mer hasn't sent her Eaton's order yet, could you ask her to buy me 10 pounds of Santos coffee? It's on sale this week for $2.55. That's all for today. A big kiss to Jean Maurice, your little wife, Leah May. P.S. I ate yesterday for the first time since I've been here. A bit of clear soup. No bread, though. Leah May had been in Seuss Hospital for nearly a week. She had been brought there with a severe pain in her abdomen and was diagnosed with appendicitis. The doctor in Seuss immediately operated on her, and the surgery seemed to have gone well. Now she was supposed to be recuperating, but something just didn't feel right. As she lay in bed, her stitches throbbing and a dull pain in her abdomen, Leah thought back to the day she was whisked home from her, whisked from her home in Grand Carrière. The morning of October 17th began as most others with the whimpering sound of her youngest child, Modis, just as daybreak break arrived. He was undoubtedly ready for another full day of fun, food, fun, and frolic. As she pulled herself out of bed to reach him, an ache swept across her stomach in what could only be described as a sensation as severe as a labor pain. Leah set herself back down on the bed and reached her hand across the other side, only to find there was no one there. 
Louis had left for the day already. Before Leah could make her way to Morris, two-year-old Jean was already standing by the crib, trying to console his baby brother by handing him a toy rattle. Thank goodness, she thought, already at the tender age of two, Jean knew how to handle, how to tend to his sibling. Leah sat up slowly, paused a few seconds, and then stood up on the chilly wooden floor. What was this constant pain she was feeling? She'd had this many times, this before, many times in fact, ever since Modis was born, but this time it was worse. She made her way to the baby, lifted him, and headed to the kitchen where she could give the boys a bite to eat. She tore open a bag of soda crackers and picked up some applesauce from the kitchen shelf. As she opened the jar, the aroma made her nauseous. She looked down at her stomach. It was completely bloated, as though she were expecting another child. Something was terribly wrong. She felt the need to go to her mother's house, where she could have some of Mama's medicine. That would settle her stomach and make her feel better. There, she and her, mother, she and her boys would be in the care of a woman who would know what to do. Mama's house was three miles away. Leah knew that she could not muster the strength to walk there with the children in tow. She decided to go ask for help from her neighbor, Anna Hardy. Hopefully, her good friend Nora would be there, and if her husband Pierre was not working, he could take Leah to Mama's house on his horse-drawn cart. With great effort, Leah slipped on a blue linen dress and a chenille sweater and dressed the boys in some play clothes. She made her way next door, carrying baby Maurice and holding on tightly to Jean's little hand. She was relieved that there was no snow on the ground yet. That could have impeded any attempts to carry the baby while she was in such pain. Still, it was chilly, even with the early morning sun peeking through the clouds on the horizon. The beginning of a long prairie winter was definitely in the air. For a split second, she thought about the need to pull the remaining potatoes from the ground for the, before the first snowfall arrived. I must remember to do this as soon as I return home, she reminded herself. The rest of the day was a blur for Leah. She barely recalled arriving at her neighbor's door or being tended to by Nora and Anna Hardy while Pierre prepared the horse and buggy. She had just a fading memory of the uncomfortable ride to her mother's house in the morning she spent there. She did not know until much later that Dr. Riddell, the local doctor from Hartney, had made a house call that very afternoon. She was barely conscious when he took her on a 30-mile journey to Surrey's Hospital in his own vehicle. What she did remember, vividly, was Jean's wailing cry as she was being carried away from Mama's front porch. <laughs> oh, Terry, you've captured... Um a woman's life, never mind the additional pain of, uh, of illness. I'm interested in you, how you transported us right back to 1932. And I'm curious about the other characters in the story and how you helped us come to know those other characters. You mentioned Sylvie. Mm -hmm. I know we've talked about the doctor and nurse. Can you tell us about how you developed those other characters yeah. around? Well, like I say, Dr. Fraser was, that was just the name. <laughs> we got the name. So I, um, my, my dad's side of the family had, uh, my dad had four brothers who were doctors. So um, I, I didn't know them well because they, they died when I was quite young. But I remember seeing pictures of them. And, and you know, doctors back in, in the early days just were so stately looking. And just, you know, and, and so I always had that vision. So that's sort of how I tried to um, build Dr. Fraser's character. Um, the nurse, you mentioned Nurse Edna. Um, so Nurse Edna, Edna becomes a friend of, of um, Leah's in the, in the story. And... Um, uh, she's a complete pigment of my imagination, <laughs> um, but uh, I, you know, I've got friends who are nurses, and uh, I, I just wanted to, uh, you know, show a nurse that was compassionate and that was professional, uh, but uh, that also had, um, you know, emotion enough to, like, to. This woman was in the hospital so long; it, it would be impossible that they wouldn't eventually become friends. And I just wanted to, you know, I think we both hope that that's the experience that Leah had when she was there. And then you, Sylvie, did you, you want me to keep Sylvie, on? I'm okay. interested in her. So Sylvie um, is the mother. Like I say, Sylvie is Leah's mm -hmm. mother. And uh, so now there are, are um, I think, three letters. 
two or three letters that Sylvie wrote to Leah, and they are also in the book. Um, and uh, so from those letters, we got to kind of know who she was. I mentioned the Grand Clarier book. There were a lot of, uh, there was a lot of information about uh, her in the Grand Clarier book. And then I, I just wanted her to, um, you know, we've all got strong women in our lives, I think. And uh, I, I just wanted her to epitomize the strong women that I know in my life. And, um, and I think I did her, I hope I did her justice. I think I, I really loved her. No. <laughs> Joe, I'm thinking that at the foreword of the book, you posed two questions and they were pretty, um, pretty important questions as I, as I read through. You said, when do we begin to realize the importance of family members who came before us? And you ask the questions, how do actions taken by our ancestors many years ago affect our lives today? Will you tell us if this experience has shed any light on those questions for you? I think the, the, the questions were, were to just to get people to realize that uh, these day-to-day -day things we do affect not only our kids, but potentially our grandkids, you know, that... If, if someone is to spend uh, a week in a hospital, it may not change, you know, your children too much. But um, a lot of the day-to-day -day things we do can affect uh, the way we live, the way we think, who we, who we associate with. But when you have something like spending a whole year in a hospital and how that affects the family, but can also affect the children of the, of the family or the grandchildren of the family. So I think it's it's just a, a way to um, you know that that a lot of things we do today will affect the future for for our children and grandchildren. Thank you, Terry. I'm thinking that you go ahead. Um, I was just thinking of adding to that. What um, you know, the the fact that these letters were kept. It's amazing what we can keep today that could be really interesting to people in the future. I'm gonna give a little story here. I, I um, My son, um, <laughs> social media guy here, um, got me on a Twitter chat last week. <laughs> so, um, you know, just a little deviation here, but he, um, you know, basically he thought that I should be a little more social media savvy. And so we were talking about social media in general and different platforms and what people, if they, people are on Facebook or, you know, Twitter or whatever, and what should happen, what would happen if something, ha if something happens to you, what happens to those accounts? So the conversation, and I was kind of quiet because I didn't, you know, I mean, I've got four followers on Twitter. I don't really, so <laughs> didn't really have a whole lot to say, but then uh, this, you know, they started talking about what would happen. So somebody's like, oh, well, if something happened to me. I just want everything shut down. I wouldn't want anybody to know anything about, you know, what I've said or, you know, and then, uh, and then others are like, oh, well, no, I think I'd want like a memorial page and everyone had their ideas. And then this one guy says, you know, wouldn't it be something like if that was kept for future generations, he says, then our grandkids could look at it way back when and know what we thought. He says, how would we ever know what our grandparents thought. So right away I looked at my son and I went, letters, it was letters, find letters. And that tells you what, you know, they, what they, uh, what they thought. And, uh, so I, I answered back and I said, you know, back in the day it was letters. People wrote letters and postcards. postcards and thought, yeah, yeah. Joe said there were a lot of postcards that were found. So that, you know, is the way people communicated. And, and that's, you know, so, so nowadays, way modes of communication are its family history in the future. I'm very interested in what other recommendations you might have for people who want oh. to embark on this kind of a project. Um, I don't know how long it took you to complete this project, but give us a bit of insight as to what the experience has been like and what you would recommend. Okay. Well, it's, uh, I guess it's taken uh, three or four years. I, I think we had a good... Uh, good relationship as far as how like how we went about writing it is is terry would generally write a chapter she would send it to me most cases i wouldn't change any especially the first few i wouldn't change anything and i guess once i got comfortable i wasn't yeah. worried about telling her to change this this <laughs> doesn't sound editor. right <laughs> uh, so we'd go back and forth so i guess what i looked at was trying to keep the uh <clears throat> the factual correct like that the names the places 
distances, like all those things I want to try and keep as accurate as possible. And then she she would send another chapter, and, and it was it was back and forth. It was it worked out really well. I don't mm-hmm. know if that would work in everybody's situation, mm-hmm. but it it seemed to work out well. I think in the end, we're both very happy with yeah. the result. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if that would be a typical way that people mm-hmm. would go about this type of project. Yeah. My recommendation is. Um, there, you know, there's so much out there that people don't even realize. We had no idea when we started. I mean, go, we, you know, Joe did a lot of, you know, vital statistics, got a lot of different certificates from vital statistics, which was amazing. Uh, Manitoba Archives, we got a lot of information at Manitoba Archives. Some of it is still restricted. There's medical information that you just can't get, and it's got to be so, so many years, I think. And yeah, um, we still are some under of the, the yeah. It's like too. eighty or ninety years or something. So it, it that that was a little difficult. But uh, yeah, archives, um, museums. We um, we spent a day uh, going to. We went. She, you know, without saying too much in the story, there's a connection to Nanette at some point. Um, and we so we spent an entire day. The, the Nanette Sanatorium was uh, people with tuberculosis um, were there, and um, they still have some of the buildings. A lot of the buildings are gone. Uh, but some are still there, and uh, we uh, spent a day with the owner. We found the owner uh, of the grounds and uh, spent a day there, and, and my sister came with me and took 100 pictures, and uh, we learned a lot that day. We got a lot of information that we were able to incorporate into the story. So, you know, you can really, I mean, it's amazing what you can find when you dig around. I I found uh, with the Mantua archives, I found uh, a lot of information there. A lot of it we didn't use, but you'd men- uh, Terry had mentioned some of the letters to uh, school board. Mm-hmm. So we had all the letters received, um, you know, it was probably 10, 10 letters received from the school division responding to the letters that Leah had sent in. So the Manitoba Archives has every letter that anyone's ever sent to a school division making a complaint. So when you're going through it, you get these boxes, and they're all in alphabetical order. So you go on A, B, C, Charles, and there it is. And you pull it out, and here's all the letters she sent to the school division. So we had one side, and here's the other ones. Like it was just, we, they, we didn't end up using those, but it was just amazing. Here's these 90, well, they would be almost 100 years old because that was before the mm-hmm. 90 year old mm-hmm. letters that all they're the all there, you know, mm-hmm. they're, yeah. and it's like, I don't know how long, well, they'll keep them forever, I guess, but it was just, you know, they're all chronological. It wasn't that hard to find, but they're, there they are. It's uh, amazing. You do start wondering what kind of letters you might have back at home that you can't remember or that you've seen before. <laughs> have we got some time to ask some uh, questions? Sure. Are there any questions from our audience here? Do, is there anything you're curious about to ask uh, Terry or, or Joe about this amazing book? Oh, I think we got to ask them a real toughie. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it's not so tough, but I, I trust that, of course, some things get lost in translation, and you're sure that she's maintained the validity and the, the realistic message that she gave her family. But eventually, en français, it's such a beautiful language. Is that something you see maybe exploring a print en français? Because, I mean, there's a lot of Francophone authors. I would love authors. that. I was, I was interviewed, actually, by uh, Radio Canada yesterday. Don't ever listen to that interview. It was my first interview and not so great. But <laughs> and in French, no less. But um, that was quest- that question was asked, and uh, I, absolutely, I would love it. I'm, you know, transferring, translating the letters from uh, French to English was a little bit easier for me, and I had my sister to help. One of my sisters helped me, and um, uh, but tr- for me to translate it to French would be would be difficult. I would need a collaborator. There's no doubt about it, um, and I would want it to be a collaborator. S- sort of relationship because I I would still want you know I think Joe too would want to keep that integrity of the book. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, your question, Lee, is absolutely, I would love to see it in French, and I think there'd be a, an audience for it. Yeah. No, that's see, awesome. the, uh, I guess the one thing I'd add, too, the the French, it's French, but uh, the, the background is Belgium. It's Belgian French, so it's not Francophone yeah, French. But it's just, still, I know it's yeah. very similar, like, but... Yeah. Just uh, there probably is some little, uh, yeah, so there's slight differences, <laughs> slight differences probably in the language itself, very slight. 
We have another question. This is for you, Joel. Um, I'm wondering if as a result of, I, I don't know if your father has read this book, has he? Yeah, he's seen it. He's seen it. Um, did it, um, was it, I don't know if this is the right question, but was it healing or was it, did it open, you know, emotions for him as having been four months old? Is that right? right. Um, that would have, I don't know, either been healing or inspiring or, you know, maybe um, was helpful in a way even for your father. I think he found the, the original translation more, um, you know, because it was a box of letters that weren't in chronological order. So I think the, the original translation with it all in order was probably more important or than than the actual result of the book. I think with my uncle, it was the other way around. It was mm -hmm. it was the book itself that mm -hmm. was more um, more important. But the I think the original translation chronological order, so it's like uh, you can see what happened step by step. It is a discovery. And it and it does open um, new thoughts and brings in new information. It's a uh, it's quite a journey. Yeah, thank you for that question. Anybody else? Yes, at the back. I was just wondering if there's enough letters for a second book. Oh, are there enough letters no, for a the, second? Well, book? the letters were all used in this book. Yeah, the school yeah. division letter. This th th that has me. <laughs> I'm sure there's a problem still yet to be solved, and, and we need these letters. So, I, know, I yeah. wasn't about to tackle the Manitoba education. <laughs> Wouldn't that My daughter is a teacher, so I thought I'd better let that one go. But she's clearly a letter writer. That, and one, might she's, be, yeah. that one might be more controversial than yeah, uh, the, <laughs> the other one. More controversial. Anybody else? Wow. Well, I have a question. You do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There was something I just didn't quite understand. The lady at the Said that it was twenty one ninety five. I can't help. Why did you charge me twenty five? <laughs> <laughs> this is my son in law. <laughs> I can not feel to warn Janet not to. <laughs> the next the next edition is going to be even more expensive. I think. For you. Yeah. <laughs> That's all you charge. <laughs> this is perfect. Nothing better than oh. having family right here in front of us. Oh, thank goodness for large French families. I think half of these people are my relatives. This is wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much all for coming. I am just thrilled, thrilled for this. And um, and I also want to give a big thank you to McNally Robinson. Uh, they are so supportive. And uh, they've had my mug up on a poster and a wall on a wall there for about a month now. And uh, I, they've just been amazing. They really have. And uh, thank you for that. Thank you.